Welcome to Lean and Agile Portfolio Management. In this video, I will tell you about my experience and my point of view on how to use Lean and Agile practices for IT portfolio management. Therefore, I will talk about IT portfolio management, that is, management of investments, projects, initiatives, activities within an enterprise IT department. My name is Martin Kramer. For more information on my services, please visit my website drmartinkramer.com. So what is this all about? As a program and portfolio manager, I was confronted with the situation that my colleagues and myself, we had lots of ideas. Ideas for projects, initiatives or activities. At the same time, we had scarce budgets. And that's probably the situation in many, if not even all, IT departments. And that would bring us to the question, how do we spend the available budget rights? Which projects or which initiatives do we tackle? Do we start? Which shall we stop? So how do we manage the budget's rights to get the most out of the available budgets and bring the best of the ideas to our customers? That brings me to the agenda for this video. We will first start with some issues on the traditional approach. And then we'll have a look at the lean and agile approach, which will solve some of the issues of the traditional approach. And finally, we can take a look at how we can implement this new approach and what challenges are lying ahead of us. The traditional portfolio management does not work. Well, at least it does not work anymore. I have basically two objections with the traditional portfolio management. First, too many things change just too rapidly. Budgets are changing. The scope of a portfolio is changing. The priorities are changed around in sometimes a weekly manner. Resources are coming and leaving, and even sometimes the management functions is changing. Moreover, the planning process is not lean. I will come to that in a minute. Let me give you some examples for the issues which I have with the traditional portfolio management approach. For example, planning a year ahead is not realistic anymore. How does that usually look? Let's say you are a portfolio management and you should plan the portfolio of projects and initiatives for year 2017. What you usually do is you start in 2016 with a collection of ideas and projects and then you start to build up your decision matrix and you decide eventually on a number of specific projects that you would like to run for the next year. And then you go into a budget process and get an approval for these uh, budgets to realize these specific projects. What happens if new ideas come in, and usually ideas don't wait for the budget cycles, they just come in uh, on a regular basis. If the idea comes in early enough, so within the collection period, it just becomes part of your plan for the portfolio and has a good chance to be realized. You might still be able to do that once you're in the decision phase, but once you're after that or even within the year 2017, it is very hard for a new idea to become realized. So usually these kind of ideas, they're being bounced back as depicted here. Let me make a bold and also provocative statement. A business case is not the right tool to select projects. Well, for long, business cases have been the gold standard and the tool of choice to justify investment decisions. Taking a closer look reveals some disadvantages of business cases, though. Firstly, we need to rely on unsure, volatile data. We need to look into the future. And since we don't have a glass bowl that shows the future to us, we need to make assumptions. 
By the way, it's a good practice to document down these assumptions um, for others to better understand the input of the business case. But often this is not done though. Anyway, these assumptions have a strong impact on the business case or the outcome of the business case. Because if assumptions turn out to be wrong, the business case can lead to totally different results. Sometimes, but also not often, we simulate different scenarios using different assumptions and inputs to the business case. But too often that is not done. Then also external factors like market trends, interest rates or currency exchanges are inputs to the business case as well. And if these assumptions and external inputs do not turn out as projected, our natural response is to claim that the business case was right. Yes, the business case was right. It was the assumptions that did not hold true. But this does not change the problem in any way. The tool has led us to the wrong results. Then a business case usually contains many parameters which can be changed and need to be fine-tuned. These parameters require judgment and again assumptions from the author of the business case. And again, the results of the business case can be largely affected by changing these parameters. Moreover, the results of a business case usually create a concrete figure or statement, something like break even will be in 9.3472 months. This creates an impression of high precision which is usually not justified because of the arguments that have just been given. It would be much better to state the results in terms of a range or a probability or probability connected to a range. While that is certainly possible, we usually lack the knowledge, um, skill or experience or sometimes even time to create and even interpret these results. Last but not least, it takes quite some effort to create high-quality business cases. Let's come to the effort. A good business case requires quite some effort. Just to give you an idea, I have gathered a few tasks that you would need to do in order to create and um, analyze the results of a business case. Let's quickly go through that. First, you have to gather some input material. And then you need to have a model for the business case. If uh, you're lucky you have already a template for a business case or sometimes you need to look up literature and create uh, a model in Excel for yourself. Very important is that you document the assumptions um, and then um, you need to work in the business case. It has all, usually two sides, a revenue side, a cost model, and you need to project um, the, the revenues or the costs and make estimates for them and also document the assumptions you have made. Then you calculate the business case, uh, you check the first results, make some adjustments, uh, and it's also a good idea to review the business case. Um, ask your colleagues, um, people who have experience with the domain and with business cases and ask them for the feedback and then also build in the feedback. And last but not least, once the results are there, you need to create a story and you need to sell and communicate the results of the business case. If the effort for a business case is too large, though, people will find workarounds. That is, a colleague has an idea and um, uh, he or she would like to state, uh, create or start a project for that. But if the business case required in order to get the budget approval uh, is such a high hurdle, um, they will look for shortcuts. And often people find um, ways and supporters uh, and promoters uh, that in the end um, uh, will lead to the situation that uh, not for every project a uh, business case is created. And some projects uh, are being started because uh, people have find clever shortcuts to go around the usual approval cycle. Selecting projects by using business cases creates waste. What do I mean by that? Let's say 
you have a number of project ideas. Here I've written them down as idea A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and idea H. Um, all of them um, have been formulated and stated. And let's say you have also created business cases and uh, calculated, for example, the return on investment for each of these ideas. Then let's say we have already ordered them in the order of the highest return on investment. So idea A brings the highest ROI and idea B the second highest ROI and so on. Um, this is a good thing because uh, it orders with um, objective um, KPI here, return on investment, the different project ideas. But in the end, um, you will probably find it not possible to do all of these. So there will be a budget line. In this case, uh, let's say projects A, B and C will make it into next year's budget. But what about ID D, E, F, G and H? You have created a business case for all of them, but they will not be realized in the next year. Um, maybe uh, idea G or H, they are not going to be done in the year after or in the year after that. So in the end, what you have done is you created waste. You created a business case and documented all the assumptions, calculated the results, um, but the projects will not be started. So this is um, the opposite of a lean approach. Um, creating uh, high quality business cases will often lead to business cases for project ideas which will never be realized. Now that we have discussed some issues with the traditional approach, I would like to present you a different kind of approach for portfolio management. I would like to call that the lean and agile approach. A different approach can address these issues. I would like now to tell you about lean and agile portfolio management, and I would like to do this in three parts. First, how to collect the demand. Then, how to decide what to start. And last but not least, is it really that simple? Let's start with the demand. The demand for new projects comes from everywhere. It comes from internal customers, your external customers. It comes from legal requirements. It comes from teams or it also comes from individuals. You could classify that further. You could classify that in functional versus technical demand or the complexity or if a demand is mandatory or optional or the impact or the business or technical architecture. In any case, demand comes from nearly everywhere inside or outside of the organization. We collect the demand in the project backlog. A project backlog is an ordered list of all project ideas or requests. The project backlog helps us to select the most important projects to start. For right now, it's just important that we understand that we need to collect and document all the different ideas for projects or initiatives. I will come back to some details of the project backlog in a minute. To be able to set the right priorities, we need the big picture. Let's say that a project request is, in this metaphor here, a skyscraper, a large house. And each request on its own is valid. Let's remind ourselves that our customers or our colleagues, when they come with new project ideas, then most of them are very valid. They deliver value. But in the end, we can only decide uh, um, if a project needs to be started, if we have the big picture. Then we can decide on the importance of each individual project request. Now here, um, this is uh, skyline with more project requests or here skyscrapers and if let's say the heights of a, of a building would um, uh, be equivalent to the importance or the value of a project this house this skyscraper is higher is larger uh, and that might mean this request is more important but this alone 
um, is not useful. We really need to see the big picture. We need to see all of the different um, requests uh, in a selection to see that there's even one request that is even more important. Moreover, sometimes we can group together certain requests and then we might be able to see synergies and group these different project ideas together to create a program and run them together within this program. Moreover, we need to regularly update and maintain our project backlog. Just like New York or Berlin, the demand is not static. It's not enough to just do this once per year and have a large round um, of gathering requests and feedback on new project ideas. We need to do this more often because our environment is becoming faster and faster. We need new products, new services um, internally or externally. Our demand changes over time and the pace of change is ever becoming faster and faster. The project backlog should also be visible. This is uh, a screenshot of a um, SharePoint that I used to capture the demand. This should be accessible by the supplier and the customer. So the people who will in the end implement the project, but also our customers internally or externally. The reason for that is that um, Ex explains the portfolio decisions by putting all the different project requests into the big picture. If people com complain that their project request is not approved and that the project is not started, they can directly see that there are lots of other projects competing for scarce resources and that some of them might be more important. Knowing the demand, we need to decide what to start. But that is not that simple. A business case might not be the right approach, as I just explained. Priorities usually do not work either. Why is that? Let me give you an example. I once had a documented set of project ideas and project requests of 50 to 60 different projects that should have been started. Now we classified this in different priority categories. And it turned out that 10 of these 50 to 60 project requests were given the highest priority. But we knew that we probably could just take three or four of these project requests and run them in the next year's budget. So we need something else, something that is stronger. How about a concept? that successfully works in the Agile software development. And that is called a project backlog. Ordering the demand is the key to selecting the right projects. A project backlog is therefore an ordered list of project ideas where we have the most important ideas at the top. It is regularly updated and also has the most detailed uh, information on the top. So the projects that are most likely to be executed um, next, which are at the top and have the highest priority, for these projects we have investigated the most, we have the most information, so that they are able to be executed or started very soon. You know, it does not make sense to do all that work and investigation and pre-up qualification for projects which are at the bottom of this project backlog. Again, this would create waste and that is the opposite of a lean approach. But in the end, where do we get the order from? The order is regularly defined in the demand management workshop. This is a workshop with key stakeholders and decision makers. The participants of this workshop need to understand the demand. And they need to understand the demand before the workshop actually takes place. So I would usually brief the participants a week before 
the actual workshop and send them material with detailed information about the different project requests that will be discussed during the workshop. The workshop needs to be conducted regularly in order to adapt to new situations. The demand and the environment today changes quite fast and this is the reason why it's not enough to just do this once per year. I try to do this every quarter, but I would at least do this three to two, two to three times per year. What is the outcome of such a demand management workshop? That's quite simple. It's the order of project request. It is the agreed project backlog. Remember that the project backlog is ordered. At the top, you will find the most important project request, which is then ready to be started. And that is a difficult workshop. Let's discuss that. A workshop has its dynamics, which can lead to wrong decisions. Decisions are made by people. If they are being made by groups of people, there is a risk that other factors distort or dominate the decision-making process. For example, if some people are better at communicating and defending their arguments, if they are more expressive, vocal or more influential than others, they can drive the decision-making process into their area of interest. You probably all know these problems. Some of them talk all the time or others use killer phrases, something like who would want to do this? Or others are not participating at all, and thus they are not buying into what's being discussed. Apart from being a good moderator, there should be some further tools to make the workshop results more objective. So what can we do for that? Business value points. Business value points are a simple way to make decisions more objective. Business value points, or BVPs, are based on an agreed set of business objectives. I'll show an example in a minute. We can very easily calculate BVPs by only asking a few simple questions. It can be easily and quickly be calculated. And moreover, BVPs can be created for nearly all situations. So how do we calculate business value points? In order to calculate business value points, we first need to agree on what delivers value to a specific function. For example, the HR function. Here you see five values that an HR project should deliver. This first step, so the definition of the values, only needs to be done once, upfront. For that, we defined a set of values and the associated weights. The idea is that every project idea is evaluated against these values. The weight indicates how, relatively, important a certain value is. The higher the weight, the more important a value is. Once the values are defined, we analyze each project request. For that, we ask ourselves how much does the request support each value. We answer that uh, on a scale from 1, which means it does not support this value, to 5, it su fully supports this value. Here we have um, a screenshot of an Excel sheet that we use um, to document assumptions and define the project idea and also ask the different questions for the values of the business value points. The simple Excel sheet calculates the weighted sum of the values. So value 1 times weight 1 plus value 2 times weight 2 and so on. The result is then called business value point or the score of that project request. It's important to note that business value points on its own are quite useless. They do not tell us anything about monetary value or return on investment. They're only good, though, to relatively compare 
project requests against each other. Here's an example for agreed business objectives for an HR organization. We have five different values with the attached weights. For example, in how far does it, that is the project request or idea, improve system integration? Does it increase or efficiency or lower cost? And what is the number of affected employees? Moreover, does it functionally improve HR business processes? And quite interesting, let's look at number five. Is it required for governance or to keep the lights on? Here you see that the weight is very high. Why is that? Why is keep the lights on so important? Well, some projects simply do not deliver value. Nevertheless, they are important. For example, we need to implement a tax change, which is legally required. For our company, that does not really deliver any value. We just need, for governance sake, uh, make changes um, to our system, and that requires effort and cost. If you would simply ask um, for the value um, or decrease of cost um, of an information system, we would not run this project, but it is legally required. So in this scheme, um, we need also have a value for governance topics like legally required changes or to keep the lights on. Keep the lights on might also be we need to upgrade the system to a newer version, otherwise it would not run anymore. And why is the weight so high in this? The reason is that often these types of projects can only score here because they will not um, increase functionality uh, or deliver any other benefits. Many of the other usual project requests can score in many categories, but we found out that these keep the lights on projects or governance projects will only score in that value. So without this high weight, that would not be done at all. And in order to give them a chance um, to be up in the project backlog and a high position, um, we give this uh, category a high value. Biggest bang for the buck uses business value points to structure the demand. But what is biggest bang for the buck? This is a simple visualization technique, or you might call it an analysis, that we can use to better understand and structure our demand. We can use it in the demand management workshop. It is simple and straightforward. Here's a screenshot. We create a flip chart showing a chart with two dimensions. First, the size of the cost on the x-axis. Here we can use money in euros, US dollar or something, or another metric for the size of a project. Then we use the business value points on the y-axis. We can place the individual project ideas onto that chart. Let's just use post-its um, with the names and stick it onto the chart according to their relative size or cost and business value points. And we can also add annotations, we can uh, draw dependencies uh, uh, or at other post-its um, for uh, annotations. What can that chart tell us? If we depict the cost over the value, there are four simple quadrants which come out. The one on the upper left is the go one. That is low cost and high value. These are the project ideas that we are aiming to implement. At the opposite, there's project request with high cost and low value on the lower right. We should not start this. The two others are a bit more complicated. Some have high cost and a high value that is on the upper right. There we need to investigate if we really can spend or should spend uh, a high cost in order to achieve a high value. And then there might be some, I 
we could call the quick wins, they have low cost, but they also don't deliver that much value that is in the lower left area. Understanding where each project request sits on the dimension of cost versus value helps us to quickly see and identify um, project requests which we should put high on our project backlog and ones that should go to the lower part. But let's not out that business value points are not an automatic. Some criteria are more important than business values. For example, dependencies. If you find out that you need to implement one project request before you can actually implement the other one, um, these are hard dependencies and they're obviously more important than business values. Moreover, there might be hard legal, fiscal or commercial deadlines. And then you just need to implement a project request before another one, even though the business value might be lower. So it is not just enough to calculate business value points and just order your project um, backlog according to that and then just pick the one on the top and implement them. The outcome of a demand management workshop is simply an ordered list. Here's an example of such a project backlog. It's the result of a three-hour discussion on different project initiatives. It's important that you come up with such a simple flip chart that shows the ordered list. It's not a categories. We have like 10 different very high important projects, but we need to come up with an order that reflects business value and also dependencies and other milestones or legally required deadlines which you have discussed during the workshop. The yellow arrow indicates the budget line. Everything that is above the yellow arrow will be started within the next budget cycle, which is below, does not have a chance and will be discussed in the next demand management workshop. Let's say you have just completed the demand management workshop and you have a project backlog which is ordered. Do you just simply pick the first projects and all start them and execute them? Probably not. We need to take the capacity of our delivery pipeline into consideration. That is, even if we have the order and the budget, we should not directly start all possible projects. The reason for that is that too many things, too many activities in parallel are just not efficient. Multitasking kills our productivity. Harvard professor Sendil Mulenatan, I hope I pronounced that right here, tells us the following observation. And probably you have observed that on your own. Faced with a time shortage, we squeeze tasks into our nooks and crannies of our calendar, leaving less and less time to switch between them. As a result, we become less and less productive exactly when we need to be most productive. Thus, we should only start projects once we have the budget and the resources. That is, there should be a filter for projects into our delivery pipeline, one for the budget and another one for the pipeline capacity. The pipeline is something like we first architect the solution, then design it, decide on building or buying it. And once we have done that, we need to test it, maybe we run a pilot and then, then deploy the solution. And in the end, the result is delivered. It's an important to take a look at the capacity to not overfill our pipeline. Is it really that simple? that is gathering your demand, putting it into a project backlog, grooming that project backlog, making sure the most important ones, the ones that deliver the most value are at the top, and then starting from the top to implement the projects? Well, probably not. We will need some fine tuning. Let me tell you about two extensions 
that we have implemented to this process. First, a lightweight process, and then how to make sure that cost-saving projects are really saving costs. Here's the challenge. How about low-risk, low-cost projects? Some project requests, let's face it, are low-risk and low-cost. Nevertheless, they might be important, they might be required, they might be legally required changes that we need to implement. But a workshop, a demand management workshop with our major stakeholders, very often, let's say every two weeks, it's just not reasonable. We will not get our major stakeholders to participate. But how do we start then um, legally required changes which might come in between the major demand management workshops? The solution is a lean process for these types of projects. It's a lean, simple, effortless way to release budget to start these low-cost, low-risk projects. This specific path is only available for specific project requests. So what's the criteria? For example, low cost, no architectural changes, very low risk. You might also add legally required or very high business value. Let's reserve a certain amount of our available budget to fund these low-risk, low-cost projects. For example, let's reserve 15% of our budget for these types of projects. Overall, there is no substantial risk increase with that. But the decision-making is lean and you don't need the full demand management workshop for that. We should also have transparency for that lightweight process. So it should be reported in the regular demand management workshop the results of your decisions as a portfolio manager to implement and start these low-cost, low-risk projects. And a representative from the provider and the customer they should decide jointly on the uses of the lightweight project. For example, the IT service manager and the business process owner, they might have a jour fix every two weeks. And in this jour fix, you have a standing agenda to decide on low risk, low cost projects. Here's another challenge. Calculated cost reductions sometimes do not lead to actual savings. Projects often promise cost savings. Often, their business cases are based on effort reductions. But not all effort reduction can be converted to monetary savings. Let's say somebody comes into your office and says, here's a project request, we should change the following process steps and eliminate a few tasks, and that will lead to some substantial effort reductions in my team. Let's say we could overall um, save another 500,000 euros in the next three years with this business case. But often these effort reductions will not lead to monetary savings for the company. In the end, not very often do people come with headcount reduction plans if they implement a simple process change, which then would actually lead to monetary savings. So what do we do when people come with these business cases? Here's my proposal. We call it the lean criteria. Does the financial controller commit to the savings? That is, we only start cost-saving projects if the savings that are projected in the business cases, and you know my complaints about business cases, but if somebody comes with a business case and says we are going to save this amount of cash in the upcoming business cycles, if these are committed by the financial controllers. That is, they are actually taking out of the next year's budget. Let's put this all together. It starts with the demand. Demand can come from everywhere. It comes from teams, from individuals, from internal customers or external customers. Some of these might be legal requirements. The next step is the dispatching or distribution. For example, the service manager can take the demand and distribute it first 
to the project backlog or some of them can be started as we just discussed by the service manager him or herself or some of the demand goes directly into operations and also another bucket might be the waste bin some of the demand is just not reasonable and will be put away and put aside and not put into the project backlog for that the service manager should have developed a criteria up front then um, from the project backlog um, a demand management workshop is held in which an order is established and a steering committee then can allow projects to be started or release the budget for the service manager to start the projects. Some of the low-cost, low-risk projects can be started by the service manager directly. We have three phases. One is the collection of the demand. The second phase is distribution and deciding. And finally comes the delivery stage. Now we come to the third part. How can you actually implement this approach? Implementation sometimes requires a paradigm shift. Here's the challenge. Let's start with the roadmap. We will not be able to have a committed three-year roadmap. Well, I believe it is good to create a roadmap, and usually we are able to create such a roadmap that shows us what we want to achieve in the upcoming, let's say, usually three years. We should actually do this, but we cannot commit to it. An HL process just does not allow us. We want to be able to adapt and we want to be able to implement agility into our process. And this is just a contradiction to committing to a fixed three-year roadmap. We will never be fully clear what will be implemented within the next 12 months. Since we want to be agile and have the flexibility to change our plan, it implies that we are never fully sure what will come in the next 12 months. People often misunderstand agile practices. Some just say, it's agile, so we do not need to follow any process anymore. I believe the opposite is true. I think agile methodologies comes with a very strict, yet simple and lean process that brings structure into the decision making. Many organizations are also or have become risk averse. A fixed price project therefore appears very favorable since it moves the risk from the buyer to the supplier. Within an agile environment you might have fixed prices but you cannot have a fixed scope associated with that. Hmm. That usually would mean that you can have a fixed price for a fixed delivery pipeline but not for the fixed scope. And trying to realize fixed price projects within an agile environment with fixed scope is difficult and often leads to failure of the approach. So we need to rethink our approach if we want to become more agile and actually make this a project success. Moreover, senior management needs to support this approach. And for that, we need to establish the required relationships with senior management and build up the trust level. And with that, we can create the understanding of the approach and get their commitment to make the required changes. Moreover, I would say we really should implement the Agile mindset. And that is we need to constantly work on the process to improve that. And the idea of Kaizen starts small and simple and improve along the way. Let's summarize. The traditional approach does not work anymore. Well, that's a bold statement. But from my experience, the traditional approach that is generating a roadmap over multi years and then committing to it and implementing it has its serious issues and problems, especially in today's fast paced and fast and ever changing environments. But lean and agile concepts are a basis for a new approach. They give us tools like a project backlog, like a demand management workshop, which helps us to structure and evaluate our project request and 
adapt agility in order to find an order in which we will implement our project request while also looking at the capacity of our pipeline. But at the same time, the implementation requires often a paradigm shift and we need to take management and different departments along the way. For right now, thank you very much for listening. My name is Martin Kramer. I would enjoy your feedback. And for more information, please visit my website, drmartinkramer.com. Again, thank you very much. Bye-bye.